We're going to talk this morning about selection procedures, and uh, when I when I talk about this, I want to emphasize I'm primarily relating to commercial meat goats. Um, this also is going to carry through to uh, seed stock producers because I'm very strongly of the opinion that a seed stock producer, if he's not meeting the needs of the commercial producers, then he's spinning his wheels. Um, you folks I know ask about show goats yesterday, and I'm not going to talk much about show goats for the simple reason I don't want to lie to anybody. And I, your question yesterday, what was it take to make a good show goat? I haven't been able to figure that out. The right bribe, I think, maybe sometimes. But, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, like JJ kind of alluded to, a lot of times the things that they're selecting for in the show ring are just counter to what we really ought to be, ought to be looking at. And, you know, the, the goats don't have any monopoly on that. You know, I remember as a young veterinarian, the quarter horse people decided that uh, they wanted to see a horse in the show ring that had nice, trim, small feet, straight up and down pasterns. You know, that's what they wanted to see. Well, that's all the shock absorber for that, for that horse. So there for a while we were seeing a lot of these horses that was winning at halter when they were yearlings, winning at pleasure when they were two-year-olds, and crippled for life when they were three-year-olds. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of why I don't get into the show aspect of it. But <clears throat> some of what we cover today will carry over to, to that. All right, give me a show of hands. How many of you... Uh, are primarily consider yourself commercial goat producers, or that's where your interest lies. Okay, that'd be you know your your goal is to hang meat on the rail. How many of you are seed stock producers? You want to raise breeding animals to sell to somebody else. How many of you are primarily show producers? Okay. Um, how many of you are involved in more than one aspect of this? Most of you. For example, those that said you were seed stock producers, you better also be uh, meat goat producers because if you're not castrating about 85% of your little bucks, you're probably messing up. So, you know, the, there's some bleed over there. The point is, uh, those of you in this room have different goals. And I can't stand up here and tell you what your goal is, but I can tell you this. Uh, you need to recognize your goal and, and then ask yourself, what do I need to do to, to make progress toward it? Because you're all different, but the first step is recognizing what your goal is. If you're having problems with parasites, I've got a good friend uh, lives in Mississippi that was having a lot of trouble with parasites. You know, his whole thrust for about the last three years has been getting more parasite resistant. You know, if, uh, if that's not an issue with you, you may have a little different goal. So how are we going to go about selecting? Basically what we're talking here is selecting which animals to keep for uh, breeding purposes. Uh, either to keep for our own replacements or to sell to somebody as, as replacement breeding animals. And this is the three tools that we've got. The visual appraisal or confirmation. You know, obviously, uh, you know, they need to, to have some visual confirmation. Pedigree or honors. Uh, you know, that may be important to some of you. Uh, if you're raising show goats, it sure is. I've been to some of these sales where uh, they read the pedigree and then they'd say, well, he's got seven ennoblements here, or he's got 14 ennoblements. And it almost seemed to me like the more ennoblements in his background, the higher the price went. 
The other one uh, that we ought to be looking at, that we probably look at the least and should be looking at the most, is performance. What do these animals actually do? There are several things we need to pay attention to. I'm going to show you this until you're sick of seeing it. Because this is one, if there's only one thing that you take away from here, out of this three days, I'd like for it to be this. <clears throat> the most important aspect of meat goat production is reproductive efficiency. It's going to affect your bottom line more than any other possible thing. And I, on this, I don't care what kind of goats you raise. I don't care if we're talking replacement females, if we're talking about uh, show goats or just commercial meat goats. If you don't have enough of them to jump on the trailer when it's time to go, you know, then you just can't make that up. So that's, that's more important than everything else put together. I want you to think about this. The buck is the most important individual in your herd. Uh, too many times I see guys, they go and they spend uh, a significant investment in fencing for their property. And then they go and they buy a herd of does and they've got you know, a significant investment in the does. And then they get ready to pick a buck and it's, uh, well, if he can get does pregnant, that's good enough. Well, it's not good enough. Your buck is responsible for 50% of the genetics in your kid crop. All of your does together are responsible for the other half. But over uh, three generations, your buck selections is going to account for almost 90% of where your program is genetically. So how are you going to pick a good buck? How do you know which one's worth getting? This is uh, one way is these buck performance tests. Um, you know, you might go buy a buck coming out of these performance tests or you might want to test some of your bucks at some of these performance tests. We're lucky enough to have a couple of them here in Oklahoma. The one at Langston is a confinement on full feed test. The one at the Kerr Foundation is a, a pasture forage based test and how good they grow on pasture. So, you know, that's something if you're not doing, you might want to look into. You notice I said down here at the bottom, who's the winner? A uh, big misconception, a lot of people say, well, the winner is the guy that's got the best performing buck in the test, right? You know, I disagree with that. I think this is a tool to learn about our goats. And uh, the, the real winner is the one that, that learns the most. At the uh, Kerr Foundation's test there at Poto, I'm thinking of one breeder that the first time that they brought goats, they finished, they brought three goats and they were the sorriest goats in the test. They really thought they had as good a goats as anybody. You know, every year we have somebody that gets mad because their goats don't do any good and they don't come back. But this breeder, next year they were back and brought three goats and they finished kind of in the middle of the test. Uh, they went home and thought about it and said, what do we need to be doing different? Um, you know, the next year was a little better. They haven't won the test in terms of having the highest performing buck, but every year they've got closer to that and it's just a matter of time until they start taking home the trophies. Okay, I want to talk about on-farm performance testing. And, uh, you know, we can, we can do a lot at the buck tests, but a couple of drawbacks, you just can't test all of your little bucks. It's not feasible, and you really, there's no test for females. And there's a couple of reasons for that. But, so we're going to look at what you need to be doing at home to select the superior animals. First thing we got to look at 
if we're going to do on-farm performance testing, we got to decide what, what do we want to check for. In beef cattle, the most common thing is a 205-day adjusted weight. Dairy goats, 305-day uh, milk yield, but what are we going to use on meat goats? What I like to use is a standardized 90-day or a adjusted 90-day weaning weight and the ratios that go with them. And the reason I like to use weaning weights is because I feel like I'm kind of getting to measure two things there. One, obviously, I'm measuring that kid's genetic ability to grow. But the other thing I'm doing is indirectly, I'm kind of getting a read on uh, what kind of maternal genetics are we looking at. And for the simple reason, if uh, you know, goat kids are just like human kids. They all got good daddies, but the outstanding ones are the ones that have good mamas. You know, the, and that's kind of the way it is with these goats. When I talk about maternals, I mean, uh, obviously she has to milk well for him, for him to grow to his potential. But there's so much more to it than that. Uh, I want a doe that'll get those kids up when they're newborns and take them to the pasture and teach them to forage. How many of you have noticed that some does uh, leave their kids laying around the pens and in the morning they'll get up and they'll go forage, go to the pasture and they'll leave their kids laying there and at some point when their bag gets full they'll come back and feed them and then go, you know, at our house those does don't last. You know, we, we want a doe that'll go teach those kids how to be goats. Um, so, you know, that goes into this and that's reflected in this 90-day weaning weight. The two things uh, that it really helps you with is if you're keeping replacements for yourself, it will help you see which ones you need to keep. And if you're selling replacements, it's going to add value to the breeding stock that you're selling. If you can show somebody, instead of just saying, well, you know, this one's really nice, if you can actually show somebody the numbers, you know, then you can justify charging more for the good ones. And uh, I suggest if you can identify the good ones, you need to either keep them yourself or make the buyer pay for the, the best ones you got. Okay, so here's, here's how we calculate this. The, we take the weaning weight minus the birth weight, because we, we want to see how much they grow, not how, where they start. Divide that by the weaning age in days, times 90, and then add back in the birth weight. And basically what that does, it adjusts everybody to uh, a 90-day figure mathematically, because you're probably not going to go wean and weigh every kid on exactly his 90th day. Uh, we do, we wean every three weeks and we take everybody that's between 80 and 100 days. Well, obviously you'd expect a 95 day kid to be bigger than an 85 day kid. So this just, this just mathematically adjusts them. Once we have for that contemporary group a list of their adjusted weaning weights, then we basically uh, just average them. We take the, that individual's uh, adjusted weight, divide it by the group average weight times 100, and we come out with a herd index. Just simply a score that's real easy to look at. And that means that in that contemporary group, the, the middle goat is 100. So if this goat scores 110, he's 10 percent better than what the, the midline was. Okay, <clears throat> List a little exercise here to, to uh, show you what I'm looking at. And this is some actual records that come from Tennessee State, uh, Dr. Browning's work. Uh, he's been good enough to let me use his records for a lot of things. But let's say hypothetically, uh, 
I've got these three does for sale, little young does. We just weaned them. Uh, you come to my farm and you want to buy a replacement doe. So we're standing there and we're looking over the fence at these dolings. And typically, this is about all you'd have to, to go by is that top doe weighs 52 pounds. The other one's 48 and a half pounds, and then the little doe is 34.7 pounds. If that's all you got to go by, which one of the, and they're all the same price, which one are you going to pick? The big one every time, right? Okay. But if we put the rest of the data in there, okay, the, the system adjusts them to the same age. It also has a little bit of a factor for whether that doe was a first time mother or not. And it adjusts them whether they were a single, a twin, or a triplet has a factor for that. And we come out with that ratio on the far side over there that is actually measures that doe's genetic potential. So now that you got the whole story on these does, which one you want now? Yeah, the second one's 35% better than her contemporaries. So, you know, that changes the whole deal. And, and the one that we like so good is okay, but she's really not statistically any better than the one at the bottom. You know, so if I said, well, this little doe, uh, you know, we could roll the price back on her, she might really be the diamond in the rough. So you kind of see how that works for you. <clears throat> Shifting gears a little bit, now let's look uh, at the value of a sire. Uh, what can you afford to pay for a buck? Assuming you're, you know, and I have people come a lot and tell me, um, well, I don't want a fancy buck. I don't want a high dollar buck. We're just raising meat goats. So let's talk about just raising meat goats. This again is actual records. Um, this is a group of sires at Tennessee State. And you can see over there, their 90 day uh, adjusted weights of their kids ranged all the way from 32 to 47 and a half pounds weaning weight. Um, I don't know, some of you may be uh, familiar with their program, but you know, these are pretty respectable weights because they, they feed no supplement to the kids, to the does. I mean, this is out in the pasture, go with God, that's what you get. Um, well, I'd like to think that everybody here is smart enough that we could pick out that sorry buck and say we don't want him. So just to kind of even it up, let's throw out the 30, the 32 pound average uh, as an extreme. And now we're looking at what? Roughly a 10 pound differential and the weaning weights in these bucks that all kind of look the same. I wonder what that's worth to you. Let's do a little math. Um, Let's say that this buck's kids, uh, the top buck, his kids uh, at weaning are 10 pounds heavier. How many does are you gonna breed to this buck? Well, everybody's operation is different, but you know he's probably capable of breeding 70 as a Kiko buck. Uh, but let's say 50, say we breed 50 does to this buck. Uh, he has the potential, we, we shoot for about a two kid average. So he has the potential of siring a hundred kids this year. If every one of those kids is 10 pounds bigger, how many pounds are we talking about? That's a thousand pounds of goat kids. Okay, you take those kids to town, what's, uh, what's 60 pound meat goats worth right now? Anybody know? Nobody follows the market. Last I looked, it was like a buck seventy-five and going up. Huh? Pay per 
pretty good buck. Dude. Yeah, let's say, let's be conservative and say they're worth a buck and a half. That's $1,500, okay? But if he's doing the job for us, are we going to use him one year and shoot him in the head? <laughs> no, we're going to use him just as long as we can use him, and hopefully six, eight years. But again, let's be conservative and say um, we use him three years. Um, now we're looking at $4,500, difference in the revenue generated. Does that mean that you can afford to give $4,500 for a buck? No. Because if you do, somebody's going to make that $4,500, but it's not going to be you. It's going to be the breeder that, you know, you bought this buck from Daryl. I think a lot of Daryl, but, you know, I don't want him to have the $4,500. I want to make it. <laughs> so, you know, but, you know, that's, that's not what I'm saying. But if Daryl's got... Uh, this good buck that I can buy for $1,000 or I can buy one that gets the does pregnant for $300. Now, which one's the better buy? Okay. You follow me? But you got to have the records because if you just tell your buyers, you know, well, this buck here is going to make you a lot of money, you know, that and 50 cents will buy a cup of coffee. If you got the records that you can show them, you know, maybe what, if you're selling a young buck, be able to show them uh, what his sire has done, what kind of weaning weights he got. Or go back on his mother and show what kind of weaning weights that she's produced. All right, the, the CD, when you put that in your computer, this is what you're going to see. And basically, the, the white columns there, you can, you can do whatever you want in there. I put the <coughs> ear tag number of the kid, um, it, whatever you want for notes, you can put in there. Um, I like to put the color of the kid and who his sire and dam was. So when I've got, I can look down that sheet and see the ones that did really good. And right away, I can see who their sire and dam was. By the same token, the ones that ain't cutting it, you know, it kind of tells on their sire and dam too. The orange is fields that you need to enter data. And basically, you just need the birth date and the birth weight, the weaning date and the weaning, the weaning date and the weaning weight. Uh, and then whether it's the first time lactation for the mother, whether it was a single twin or triplet, and then the green over there, it does the math for you. And nothing, there's no rocket science. But, you know, what led to this is we used to, we used to weigh kids at weaning time until dark and then go in the house and eat supper. And then I'd sit there half the night trying to do this by hand for a lot of kids. And, um, uh, you know, the later it got, the harder it was to make the calculator come up with the same number twice. And, uh, you know, this takes a lot of the error out of it, and it's pretty quick and easy. I have a question. Yes. What do you do with your kids that don't make the meaning, your kids that die? Okay. You've already put them in the program. Okay. What, the way I handle that is uh, this slide is, is what my records actually look like when I get through kind of customizing it. Um, how many of you are familiar with Excel? Okay, this, all this is is an Excel spreadsheet. And uh, if you have trouble figuring out what you can and can't do with it, give a call and I'll try to help you because you, there's no way you could be more ignorant than me. And, if, if, and I figured it out. But uh, to answer your question, one of the things I did is I, as I enter them in here, I make the little girls pink and the little boys blue so I can tell at a glance, you know, which is which. And um, if, I, if I have a kid that dies or if I have a kid that for some reason is raised as an orphan or, or Linda feels like she needs to supplement it, Sometimes a kid on a really old doe, she needs to help a little. 
anything I do that would mess up the, the uh, program, I color that kid gray and leave him out and then he just is, you know, he just gets a not applicable. And that way you know, he's, he doesn't mess up the results. A, a simple way to put it is he doesn't go into any contemporary group. But that's, you know, I know that's little and I'm sorry you can't see it, but any of you who want to, I'll pull out a printed record after a while on a break or something and show you. Yes, sir. Dr. Clark, do you have a, after you do this, do you have a separate uh, sort of form that keeps track of the does produ production over time? In other words, do you have a way to, to look Track it over multiple years? Yeah. The question was, did I have a way to track this for a given doe over multiple years? And I don't have a good way other than to, um, the, I keep all of these. So, you know, if, uh, uh, if Jim wants to know about a specific doe, I may have to go back and pull the 2010 records and see what did she do that year, and in 2011, what did she do? It would be good if I did, but I, I just haven't got that done. Yes, sir? I suggest that, I guess also that you don't have any way of keeping that information on the dam and the sire for a kid with a program that will then integrate the two, you don't have that. No. No. Yeah. Some of you guys that are that are real computer whizzes might be thinking about how, uh, you know, if you can help me figure out how to do some of these things and make it user friendly, boy, I, I could have a lot of fun, you know, passing them out for you. But basically you get the idea here, kind of how it works. Have I mentioned that doe herd reproductive rate is the major determinant of income? Okay, and, and here's an example of what I mean. Uh, one thing I hear a bunch is, well, this doe only had one kid, but it was, a, it was a real whopper. It was a really good son of a gun. Well, I don't care. If she only has one kid, that kid can't do good enough to make up for what it could have been if there was two or three in that litter. Yes, sir? I wouldn't say that she probably will. There is some heritability there. It's probably not as big an issue as some people think, but it is an issue. And in certain instances, it's more of an issue than others. Um, if you'll bear with me till tomorrow, on the re we're going to talk about reproduction for an hour, and that's one thing we'll go over pretty in depth tomorrow. Just a few little rules of thumb. Um, man, don't buy replacement animals. I don't care if we're talking does or cows or what. Um, the sale barn is where you sell, not where you go buy breeding stock. Uh, I made that comment one night right here in this building and there was a sale barn operator that got so mad I thought he was going to have the big one. But it's the truth. You know, uh, people don't take their best breeding stock to the sale barn. You know, you take the culls that you're trying to get rid of. Um, you know, that top rule there is one to remember. There's probably something wrong with every one of them. But you don't know if it, if it never saw a fence it respected or if it hadn't kidded in three years, or it had kids, but they all died because it's not a good mother. You don't know what the issue might be, but chances are there is one. And the bottom is, um, you know, the bottom is worth remembering too. If you're in the seed stock business, you know, just ever so often I get to talk to somebody that's really disenchanted 
because, you know, a year or two ago, I talked to them and they bragged about how cheap they bought their goats. And they were smarter than anybody out there because they bought their goats cheap. And now they're unhappy because they just, you know, their goats don't top the market. What could it possibly be? Well, it might be that you started with inferior stock in the first place. A few rules for culling. Don't fall in love if you want to show a profit. You know, I want to, I want to get a little interactive here. I'm going to put you guys on the spot. How many of you are making money with meat goats? And by that, where I draw the line, that means you're making significant enough income with meat goats that you pay taxes on the, on the proceeds. One, okay. One of the things that's important, if you, you know, how many of you have goats because you enjoy having goats? I'm gonna let you in on a secret. You'll enjoy it a whole lot more if they're making money, okay? But one of the things you need to do, and, and it goes right with what we're talking about this morning, is you, you need to decide, ask yourself, is this a hobby or is it a business? If it's a hobby, there's, there's nothing wrong with that, okay? But if it's a hobby, you make emotional decisions. If it's a business, you make business decisions. So, so you need to ask yourself that question. And it can be a business that you enjoy, but it's pretty hard to be a hobby that makes money. You see Dr. Hart's quote down at the bottom there. But uh, he's, I also heard him tell some folks one day that, uh, you know, why are you so attached? There's a lot of goats out there you can own. And that's true, there is. Some other things we can think about, this doesn't, the same system doesn't have to be limited to adjusted weaning weights. We can look at six month uh, weights. We can look at 12 month weights. Okay, one thing that, that I think is really important to consider is the internal parasitism. We talked about that yesterday. You guys, uh, you know, understand now that a few of your goats are responsible for most of your problems. This is a record that, uh, that we use for keeping track of that. Uh, real simple, little spreadsheet. You got all of the does in the herd going down the left side. And you can see across the top is the dates when they were I scored. I told you yesterday that I'd show you the, the record I prefer. And, uh, you know, as we eye score them, we just write down what the eye score was. Yes, ma'am? No. No, it's just, it's way too simple to worry about. If, if you got Excel, you know, you can set this up. It's pretty simple. But um, we write down the FAMACHA score. If we worm them, um, they get a W by their number. Uh, you can see. For example, this doe right here, she started out okay and then wormed, wormed, wormed a little better and then wormed and wormed. If you don't mind, I would like to have a moment of silence for old number 43 <laughs> because she's no longer with us, okay? On the other hand, on the other hand, uh, for example here, P20 is an old doe, but if you look across all summer long, she's all FAMACHA ones and twos. So uh, this, again, it does two things for you. It helps you figure out, now you've got the records to help you figure out who do I want to propagate by saving daughters and which ones need to go down the old meat goat trail. You follow me? 
And if you're going to sell breeding stock, can you see how you can turn this into increased profits? I mentioned the, the breeder in Mississippi that I've worked with. Um, he, he just strictly will not buy breeding stock unless you can show him a record similar to this um, because that's, that's where his main problem lies. So once again, once you can identify the good ones, you need to either keep those genetics in your herd or if you sell them as replacements to somebody else, if they're going to get the good ones, you need to make them pay for them. There's a few limits on this. Um, for one, it only compares goats within that contemporary group. You know, that's why um, it asked for, for the contemporary group on the records. It's not fair to compare kids born in February with kids born in May, for example. And the other thing is you've got to realize it's only on that farm. You know, uh, a goat that scores uh, a 110 index on a given farm, you know, on, on somebody else's farm, that might be a 92, you know. So it, it only compares within that contemporary group. Have I thought to mention that reproductive rate is the major determinant of profitability. This doe here in this picture uh, was about 14 when this picture was made and still raising triplets every year. She's not a big goat. She's not a fancy goat. She's just a very, very productive goat. Another thing to think about is longevity in the herd. It costs a lot of money to, to replace does. Um, this old doe here, uh, this doe was 13 and raising twins when this picture was made. Uh, she's getting to be a little bit of a hard keeper because her teeth aren't very good anymore. But look at the bag on that goat. One of the major reasons that I see does leaving the herd is blown bags. You know, this, this doe, I, I have no clue how many kids she raised over her lifetime, but she had twins or triplets every year of her life and uh, still got a good bag. She's no longer with us, but uh, you know she's a doe that right up until the end was productive. <clears throat> this is some of uh, uh, the Tennessee State research. You know, some of you are familiar that they did uh, a lot of doe herd work with uh, these three breeds. And after five years, you know, they still had most of the Kikos, pretty much most of the Spanish, uh, was getting pretty short on the boars. That is, they didn't make it that long. Um, how many of you remember, did you see it's been, boy, probably three years ago now when they had the big flood at Nashville. You remember seeing that on the news? Some of you might have caught a news article about one of the Tennessee State professors that they had to go rescue out of the river. Uh, he was floating down the river on a round bale and they had to get a boat and go get him. Well, that was my good friend, Dr. Browning. When I heard that on the news, you know, my first thought was, I'll bet anything, that's Richard. <laughs> and, and it was. He had, what happened is the flood took a couple of guardian dog puppies that he had there. And before anybody could stop him, he jerked off his coat and tie and his shoes and went in the river after those puppies. Well, they got the puppies and got him and them up on a round bale, but he was too exhausted to fight the tide to get back out. So they... I had to come get him. And not long after that, I was at a uh, conference where he and I was both speaking. And we were sitting around kind of informally, and he was telling about the flood. 
And he made the, somebody said, well, did you lose a lot of does? And he said, we did, we lost a lot of does. But uh, we lost so many Kikos and so many Spanish, but we only lost one Bordeaux. And so somebody kind of perked up and said, wow, that's interesting. What do you attribute that to? Is it just because the boars are tougher? Or are they better swimmers? Or what do you think? And he said, no, we only lost one Bordeaux because after seven years of it, one Bordeaux is all we had left. <laughs> so anyway, it's something to think about. I think you've got this stuff in your material. I'm not going to belabor these points, but these are some things that you want to look at is, uh, you know, how many pounds of kids, how many numbers of kids, uh, lameness cases. A lot of you were uh, talking yesterday about, uh, you know, some of the things related to lameness. You can see here, you know, breed choice has a whole lot to do with how many feet you're going to have to doctor. This study, some more of Dr. Browning's work, uh, in this study he took the three breeds, crossed them every way they could be crossed, whether it was a cross or a, or a, a like to like, and come out with, uh, this is weaning weights of the kids. And interesting enough, the, the biggest weaning weights came when he used a boar buck on a Kiko doe. Okay, so that might be something to think about for those of you that are, are strictly interested in selling pounds of kids. The next biggest group for weaning weights was a Kiko buck on a Kiko doe, followed by a Spanish buck on a Kiko doe. And then from there, it kind of, you know, the pattern breaks up. But I think this is really interesting then that, you know, the, the Kiko does have the strong maternal traits. They have their kids and get them up and get them going. And, you know, this to me really emphasizes uh, the value of having those good mothers. You know, you've got to have good maternal traits or you're spinning your wheels. Just in review, um, the three things we can use for our selection decisions. Everybody uses visual appraisal. You know, nobody buys a three-legged goat. You look at him and you count his legs, right? Uh, pedigree may or may not be important to you. But the performance data, you know, is what we got to get down to. That's what we got to be basing our selection. You got to make business decisions. And you can't make business decisions unless you have good records. You know, I don't like to keep records on anything. Um, it's, it's my least favorite thing to do. But everything that we do, if we're going to do better, we have to keep good records. Um, you know, my boss is sitting in the back of the room back here. You know, he expects me to kind of keep some records on the programs I do and what accomplishes something and what doesn't because next year he would like for me to be more effective than I was last year. Same thing here. Any business, I don't care if you run a restaurant, whatever, you better know what your costs are. Um, Always somebody says, well, that's okay, but you know, I can't afford all this fancy stuff like scales and things like that. That's a, a digital fishing scale from Walmart costs about 15 bucks. Uh, I would suggest if you can't afford $15 for a set of scales and a five gallon bucket, you probably don't need to be in the livestock business. But that works really good for weighing newborns. This is a, a very economical digital uh, postal scale from eBay that uh, a breeder I worked with sandwiched that between, uh, between two pieces of plywood for, where they could weigh their bigger goats 
worked really good. Beware of single trait selection. I'm going to kind of conclude with this slide because this, this really means a lot to me. A couple of years ago, I went to the American Bovine Practitioners Meeting in Albuquerque. Um, here in Oklahoma, I get to work with a lot of beef herds. We don't have many dairies, and I don't hear much from the ones we do have. But at that meeting, they, they have all kinds of cattle programs. And there was one talk that was scheduled for early in the morning uh, from a, a pretty well-known dairy practitioner. And uh, I had no interest in going to a dairy talk. But uh, they had a drug company that was sponsoring that talk by furnishing a free breakfast. And I, I'm a, a morning person. I'm up and around in the morning anyway. And I did have an interest in free eggs and bacon. So I went to his talk and was, was really surprised. I got a lot of good out of it, general stuff. But this is one point that he made in conclusion, and, and I'd like to, to run by this. But, but his thought was, um, in any business, and especially any livestock business, that basically we've got three groups. You've got the top group that are making money, doing well. You've got a middle group that's just kind of hanging in there, you know, and, and one year may be okay, and the next year, you know, they're wishing it had been better, but they're kind of hanging in there. And then you've got the lower group that are losing money, throwing money out the window, and their days are numbered. You know, I don't care, uh, I don't care how well backed you are when you start. Um, you know, if you're losing money, that comes to an end. Uh, how many of you have ever heard Dr. Frank Pinkerton talk? Frank likes to tell people the, the best way in livestock, the best way to end up with a small fortune is to start with a large fortune. And, you know, there may be something to that. But anyway, this lower group is just not going to make it. And there's nothing you can do about it. You know, that's the way it's going to be. You guys all know somebody who has started out with big hopes and aspirations in the livestock business, and now they're back to working for wages. So, you know, the, the bottom line is if you want to be in this business five years from now, then you need to take a hard look at your program and figure out what do I need to do to get in that top third. The fact that you devoted a pretty good chunk of time out of your life to come to this program you know, tells me that you're, you're serious. But you need to always be thinking, you know, what do I need to do? And if keeping records is what you got to do, you best all keep records. <laughs> I mentioned a while ago that you know that you you got to have good mothers. These are two week old kids. Uh, we got a snowstorm, and I got a chance to snap this picture of two week old kids, and they're out digging through the snow, seeing if they can find something green under it. And that's not a coincidence. That's because their mamas taught them to get out there and, and make a living. Um, you know, it looks like there's nobody here but kids. Their mamas are there. They're just out of the camera view. But, but their mamas got them up, took them out, and said, if you want something to eat, this is what you got to do. Questions? Yeah, I got one, Dave. Yes, sir. Let's go back to sire selection. OK. Um, it takes a year, two, or three to develop any, any, any uh, substantial records on the sire. Mm -hmm. If you had a lot of bucks or sold as yearlings, you know where I'm 
going yes, to yearlings or even bucklings. Or even bucklings, exactly. So is this just uh, hope and prayer? It's going to turn out to be, you know. What I, you know. Yeah, it, it's not an exact science. Uh, and there's been a lot of discussion about developing EPDs. Any of you that are, are involved in the cattle business knows how important EPDs are uh, to selecting the right bull for your program. We're just not there yet in goats. But uh, what, what you can do is whether, whether you're buying or selling or deciding what to keep for your program, uh, you're right. It's going to be two or three years until you know. But you, what you can do is you can go back and look at the sire. Let's say we're looking at a buckling and trying to decide whether he's going to be a herd sire or not. You can go back and look at his sire and, and see what his sire has done over the past several years, and that's an indicator. Go back and look at his dam and see what kind of what kind of production she's had, how her kids have performed, and you know that's not going to be a guarantee, but it gives you a better chance of selecting right. And the other thing that I like to do, if I can, and I'm sure not a geneticist, but there's um, there's some individuals that cross well with certain other individuals some families that cross well with other families. So if I, that even takes it a step further. If I can go back and say, you know, his sire has been crossed with his dam three times before and this has been the result, you know, then, then it gives me an even better chance. Does that answer your question? And for now, that's what we got to work with. Yes, sir? There's a producer sales like Unfortunately, too often not. Okay. Um, uh, typically, at one of those production sales, if there's multiple consigners, typically there'll be two or three of those consigners that have the records and make them available, and several of them that don't. But what I've noticed, and, and it's starting to catch on, is the, the guys that do have those production records and make them available are usually the ones that see the much better prices for their goats. So as more and more seed stock breeders are seeing that it translates into more money, I'm seeing more and more seed stock uh, guys that are, that are starting to adopt that. Yes? This is way off the subject, but it's a question that's been haunting me for months, even though I don't have goats. Everybody Gene, you want to come up? Goats are going to die, so I'm going to kill some. So after I kill them, what do I do with them? How do I get rid of the carcass if you got dead goats? Well, you know, you're in luck <laughs> because we're going to answer that for you tomorrow. Okay, I, I'm pretty sure it's out at the farm tomorrow. They've set up a, a demonstration on how to deal with that. All right, good. Go ahead and get you lined up, and I'll take a few more questions. Right, yes, ma'am. Um, is there, I mean, I know I, with chickens, you can't just introduce a, one chicken into the herd because the other chickens will kill it. Is there any problem with that um, with um, goats? The, the question, if you didn't hear it back there, was uh, with chickens, if you, if you introduce one new chicken into the flock, the other chickens will kill it. And she wondered, was there a problem with, like that with goats? There is, but not near to that extent. If you come in with new goats or a new goat, you know, they're probably going to have to start at the bottom of the pecking order and work their way up. But it's not to the point, it's, it's more like the bully might pick on them, but it's not like everybody's going to gang up and turn on them like chickens do. Okay. Yes, sir. I have a pinto cross and a bush. Anyway, she had her twins this year were, I call it premature. I did not weigh them, but they were still not in the regular cell. Would you consider culling her or do you think it was? 
Is this the first time she's kitted for you? Yeah, this is the first, her first kids. There's a lot of things that could cause that beyond her control. I'd probably give her one more chance. You know, I'd put her on probation. <laughs> and if she does it again, she'd be gone. But, you know, she may turn out to, you know, to, to be one of your best ones if it was, you know, something infectious causing them to be born premature. A lot of times trauma can cause that, so. We moved her about three weeks, about five miles, three weeks before she had her kids. Uh-huh. So we didn't know she was pregnant when we got her. Yeah, I'd give her one. I'd give her one more shot. Will the little ones ever catch up? They're eight weeks old. They're eight weeks old and they're about. Yeah, they can. You know, a lot of times, you know, a lot of times they'll go ahead if they're healthy and go on, and it just takes a little more time to get there, which time is money. Question over here, yes, ma'am. Uh, probably, probably as good as any, and you don't want to breed daughters back to the father. That's too close. However, if if you only keep one uh, buck, you may need to change bucks every year because of that. Okay, but maybe uh, maybe you don't because maybe you don't save replacements every year. Maybe you have a good class. Maybe 2012 is the good class, and you save a lot of replacements, and then you don't need to save any for a few years. The other thing is if you are keeping these records and documenting what you got, uh, just because you're done with him, you know, doesn't mean that he's done. You know, if you've got the records and, and he's ringing the bell, you know, there's somebody else that's going to want that buck because now he's proven you got the records. This is what his kids did. Um, you know, so you got added value. You can afford to replace him, if that makes sense. One more question. How soon can you read that book back to his, not his offspring, but his next generation? How, third, fourth generation? I don't know if there's a fixed answer for that. Um, you got an idea, Gene? I guess it depends on how how big a risk taker you are, you know. But what do you think? Well, it, it kind of depends on what your goals are. You know, you can concentrate genetics by breeding a daughter back to a father. Uh, you know, we call that line breeding in Western Oklahoma. They call it. Uh, inbreeding over here. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, uh, it, there are, you can concentrate genetics so much that you end up with problems. If you've got a bad gene in there and you breed it too close, it's going to crop out. You'll see spider lamb disease or crooked legs or something like that. So it, uh, you know, uh, we do a lot of line breeding in horses, concentrating genetics, but then we get a lot of parrot mouths and one testicles and things like this. So, uh, I imagine in the goat business you do a lot of outcrossing, don't you? Mm -hmm. And just using uh, unrelated individuals. That's where you get most of your hybrid vigor. Well, this is my scenario. I've got 10 does, new book. I've got three, two yearling books, unrelated to anybody. My, old, my new book is going to breed them 10 does. Those offspring is going to get bred to one of the other books. Their offspring is going to get to my other young books. Uh -huh. The third year. That fourth year, can you bring those back to the original book? Yeah, I, I think you can by that time. But uh, one thing I do, I want to caution you. Uh, I see a mistake that a lot of people make is they, they try to, to use too many bucks or they own too many bucks. You know, and uh, if your hybridization is a good thing, that's the outcrosses Dr. Parker was talking about. But if you're not careful, 
it degenerates from hybridization to mongrelization. You know, because you get so many things going so many different directions, you can't keep track of it and repeat it, then it's not any good to you. You know, so, um, so limit the number of bucks. Um, and uh, that way you can, you know, you can kind of tell. If you've got two bucks, you know, it's pretty easy to, to say, well, this buck's doing a better job than that buck. And it's probably even easier to say, you know, this buck may do a better job on a certain kind of doe. But if you, get, if you get more than about three bucks in the mix, next thing you know, you know, it's just, uh, it's kind of like trying to look at a can of worms. You can't tell where one line starts and another stops. <laughs>